Hi, sorry. I'm Andrew Turner. I'm the director of Esri's Research and Development Center in Washington, D.C., and I'm also on the GSC. And we also welcome our online participants, although this time I don't think we're going to um, introduce you. Uh, if you should have a question or comment later, you please introduce yourself when you do that. And I'm going to turn this over to Mark Reicher, who's going to moderate this session. Well, good afternoon. I hope everybody had a good lunch. And the uh, carbo rush isn't going to dampen our questions this afternoon. Um, I'd like to introduce a topic, uh, mapping the new Arctic. I think we all understand the conditions today are very different in the Arctic than they were uh, just a few years ago. And the implications and opportunities exist on the economic, environmental, and social fronts. Uh, there are a range of different issues and opportunities that uh, I think are, are very much um, of exa uh, worth examination today or of importance in terms of the way we go forward uh, with science. Um, we have several participants today who will be um, uh, contributing. Uh, Michael Tischler from USGS will be giving us a keynote. I'll, I'll do an intro for him in a second. And then we have a number of panelists, uh, Rachel Bernstein and Mac. Mac is okay, right? Mac Ortiz from NGA Research, Nicole Kinsman from NOAA, and Michael Brady, cartographer from NGA. Thank you, sir, for your service. Solo cartographer. <laughs> I'll introduce our panelists uh, last, but I think right now I'll introduce uh, Dr. Tischler. I've known Michael for a long time, uh, and we've we've probably met more often in these environments than uh, elsewhere, Mike. But uh, uh, he's the director of the National Geospatial Program at U.S. Geological mm -hmm. Survey. He has management oversight of the National Geospatial Program, including the National Map, Technical Ops. Uh, 3DEP, the 3D elevation program, um, and as well as research activities uh, performed at the uh, Center of Excellence for Geospatial Information, uh, and uh, a requirement and mandate for national re disaster response. Um, he's also got a background in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, so I can't think of anybody better to lead off this discussion. I think what time? <laughs> <laughs> But, um, you know, we did have a project recently, a pilot in the, uh, the Arctic, and I think, uh, I think your presence and reflection on that and way forward is going to be very informative for the group. So, Michael, over to you. Okay. I'll stand up here, that's okay? More, is there a clicker? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very interesting topic. I do want to at least acknowledge Kevin Gallagher. He's the Associate Director for Core Science Systems at USGS. Some of you may know him. He's been... Uh, Michael, sir. We have people online. That's one of these? Is this working? Okay. Yep. Uh, he's been very, very involved in the Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure Program I'll be talking about, as well as Alaska Mapping. Uh, he would really like to be here, but it's unfortunately a schedule didn't allow it for today. Uh, um, these are... Very, very interesting and important topics, and I've been at USGS for about four or five years, and I've been able to, been able to see them develop, um, and especially the Arctic, or the, excuse me, the Alaska mapping portion has been very valuable and very rewarding to see progress on throughout the, the last few years. Uh, USGS has, of course, a mapping mission that dates back to the, the start of USGS more than 130 years ago, and that persists today in governance structures and in some of the technical products and services we put out, and involves us in governance uh, governance boards and structures across the world and domestically within the U.S. And uh, we serve as a national mapping agency for the United States domestically. Outside of that, we have our colleagues at NGA, but if you're dealing with domestic issues and domestic mapping, the USGS is the lead agency for that. And we coordinate amongst the federal family along with states and local governments to be able to put forward that mission. Uh, so I'm going to talk today uh, about the Arctic and some of the efforts that the USGS has led within the Arctic in the past few years, why it's important, and a bit about where we're going in the future. Uh, I think for this room, these are probably known issues. The Arctic is changing dramatically, and uh, ice and permafrost are melting, and that has a lot of impacts on, on infrastructure, let alone populations. Uh, more people are, are being active in the Arctic, and they've been able to, to mitigate the the environment up there. Um, there's more development for natural resources, for oil and petroleum. Uh, there are shipping lanes that are opening up, so there's just a lot more activity in general. The coastlines are changing uh, for, uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, 
the natural resources that are in greater demand, we've seen just within the USGS within the past few years, uh, more of a focus on critical mineral extraction and identifying where there's more critical minerals. Alaska is that's a, a big part of their state's natural resources. They're intimately involved in that, and that stretches across the Arctic. It's not just Alaska. Uh, the other opportunity is that mapping technologies are increasing, whether it's from fixed wing or from satellite observations or even the processing technology. What you can do with the data that's getting better is just as good as the data itself, which is getting better. There are two particular efforts I'm going to talk about today. The Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure, which is a collaborative effort uh, loosely organized and connected with the Arctic Council that connected uh, geospatial offerings from eight different Arctic countries that make up the Arctic Council, uh, United States, Canada, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Russia, Denmark, as well as the Alaska specific mapping objectives that the USGS led with other federal partners uh, to, to really enhance and modernize the geospatial foundation for Alaska, which was woefully out of date. Um, I want to preface this both with a, a kind of a reminder of just how difficult it is to operate in this environment, both technically and physically. The internet connectivity is, is a dill environment. It's, it's disconnected, intermittent, and limited bandwidth. Uh, so when you're transferring data, you've got to think about that. The road access is difficult, to say the least, uh, and that extends to the, the air traffic that you, you've um, a lot of Alaska gets around by personal aviation, and the, the conditions aren't always conducive to operating or making a collection when you want. That means the plane's got a lot of downtime. That means there's a lot of cloud cover that might interrupt satellite observations. A lot of things you got to think about there. It's an enormous state. You, you know, you often see it on on high school or elementary school maps, and it's tucked away somewhere near Hawaii. <laughs> you don't, you don't often think about uh, the the actual size of Alaska relative to the, the domestic United States. Um, some of the, the advocates for Alaska and their congressional delegation are very fond of saying that if you cut Alaska in half, Texas is still the third largest state. Uh, I mentioned the weather. It, it's, it's difficult to operate on our, on, for humans. It's also difficult for technology and battery life. Uh, just a difficult environment, which makes it all the more challenging for geographers and cartographers. Um, but we rise to those challenges, right? Uh, another way of looking at this, this is uh, borrowed from a colleague of ours at, at Dewberry, Dave Mounty. He's been around the block for a number of years. I'm sure some of you have run into him and worked with him. Fantastic gentleman. He's helped the USGS and a lot of our federal partners in our approach and strategy to mapping the Arctic and, and our contributions in Alaska. Uh, it's the it's largest area of any state. There's a number of UTM zones, long distances, enormous mountains, all these things make it really, really hard to work. Uh, and I'll, I'll this has more, this is focused on Alaska, but I think these issues are, issues are systemic across the Arctic. All of the countries are, have the same issues to deal with. Um, it, it just makes it a more difficult and challenging environment to operate in, but because it's so strategically important, because there's more of a focus on there now, we got to figure out how to deal with these challenges and overcome them. The Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure allows, it's a, it's a construct that allows sharing geospatial data in an efficient and flexible way. I mentioned that this was uh, a collaboration of eight countries that came to develop this SDI for the Arctic. Uh, and because they recognized that the geospatial, geospatial foundation for the Arctic underpinned a, a, a tremendous amount of applications for all of the countries, and they all benefit by contributing and putting all their information on a common framework. The, the development, as I mentioned, is facilitated by these countries and the national mapping agencies within each country, and the governance structure for that is uh, is becoming quite quite good and quite strong. The it follows the same leadership as the Arctic Council. Uh, so when the U.S. has leadership of the Arctic Council, the U.S. has leadership of the Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure Group. Uh, that happened about four or five years ago, I think. My, uh, I mentioned Kevin Gallagher. He became the chair of the Arctic SDI, and he, he really took the bull by the horns and, and made a lot of progress in how we collect and present geospatial information across the Arctic, working with these eight partners. This was uh, had been previously endorsed by the Arctic Council. We have an MOU in three languages. Um, the senior Arctic officials, which is an official designation, uh, recognize this and the value of this, which is really great. So there, there is some codification behind this. It's not just people getting in a room. There's some uh, international governance and structure behind what this is and some accountability to higher boards like, uh, like the Arctic Council and, and CAF. The, 
The SDI is focused on working with organizations to make their data available. That's a big part of it, is getting the data out there and making sure that the uh, it's accessible to everybody in a way that it can be used and it's interoperable. And it's built toward the requirements of the stakeholders. In this case, it's the Arctic Council and those member countries. Uh, and that we follow best practices for information management, like looking at the life cycle of geospatial data and maintenance and metadata and making sure that it's not just something that's going to be out there for a year and then die, that this is something that has to be maintained and, and that you can continue to contribute to it. Uh, and Mark will be happy to hear it's built on open data standards. You, you can't do something like this amongst eight countries unless you have standards and unless you agree, agree to those types of practices going into it. And that was a big part of what this spatial data infrastructure was about. A big development in the last few years of the Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure was a portal, a place to go and retrieve a lot of the information. And that's uh, a part of what I wanted to bring this discussion today to folks was to raise awareness of the, S the Arctic SDI geoportal and the data, and the same thing in Alaska. Uh, so you all are aware of the data that's out there. Sometimes the government is not so good about promoting the, the large amounts of effort and time that we put into things. So I wanted to make folks aware of that there is a portal out here where you can find data that's been, that's authoritative from these countries, which I think is really important. You can do location searches, search through the catalog by metadata. Um, there's a few other things I'll walk you through here. Um, and it's even available, the data is available in multiple languages and in different projections depending on from which country you're accessing. Uh, begins with a topographic base map, and that is uh, the 124K maps delivered by the national mapping agencies of each country. Um, if I uh, uh, if I remember right, this uh, the portal itself is hosted by Finland, but it's really the, a contributing effort of all of the national mapping agencies. We've given our data. It just so happens that Finland is the one that's hosting the data and responsible for that particular geo portal right now. But the USGS, uh, we, we gave our Alaska maps. That's our contribution to the Arctic. Uh, all the other countries did as well. It's integrated with the international bathymetric chart of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, there is an API available. And um, uh, you'll see a, an elevation layer on here I'll get to in just a minute that came from the Polar Geospatial Center and their development of the Arctic Dam, which I'm sure some of you are aware of. There's a gazetteer which links to the authoritative names databases from multiple countries within the U.S. That's a geographic names information system that allows people to be able to search and find locations in the Arctic, which from what I gather was not something that was available prior to this kind of an SDI. So that's another important, a definite important development. Uh, there's more than 3 million place names and includes land and marine features both. Uh, we had a, a preface discussion with the presenters, and I, I believe none of us could determine what GEBCO or SCUFFIN or ARMSDVIG stood for. No, somebody knew. <laughs> but it, I, I certainly was unaware. <laughs> Anybody on the panel reckon, remember that, what they were? Arms Arctic Region Maritime Spatial Data Infrastructure Working Group. Okay. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a great panel today. <laughs> Thank you for that. They were new to me, I will say, except for GNIS. Uh, an interesting development, too, uh, you always want to look at the data like you're used to looking at it. So this particular portal has the ability to reproject the data. If you're coming from Russia, if you're coming from Iceland or Finland, you can project the data to whatever is suitable for your own country, and it's uh, in a way that it's more familiar to you. The, some of the applications, uh, we mentioned that, I mentioned that I would, this is meant to be something that's maintained and sustainable. As you develop new data and as you are develop new projects, you can contribute to this. The, the countries can contribute. One area was the wetlands project at the Arctic Council, uh, the Con Conservation for Arctic Flora and Fauna group uh, supported was this wetlands project. And that was an Arctic SDI collaboration to map wetlands across the Arctic, which I believe shows up on this geo portal now too. Of course, wetlands are important everywhere, doubly important in the Arctic. The uh, elevation model for the for this portal was another significant development. Uh, it just so happened I mentioned that there was uh, new mapping techniques that were available. One of them was applied to the Arctic. Uh, Paul Marin, the director of the Polar Geospatial Center at the University of Minnesota, had taken some some code that uh, open source code and applied it to the Digital Globe Satellite Archive to come up with the uh, structure from ocean from satellite based imagery solution to create an elevation model across the entire Arctic, backed by high performance computing. He was able to to come, I think he's on a second or third version now, but 
where there was no elevation data before, he was able to create a consistent elevation base. Uh, it was really, really remarkable. And, and it was highly automated uh, and developed very, very fast. And this was a great offering to these countries that either don't have the capacity or the means or it's just too difficult to go collect elevation data there personally. They were able to leverage uh, what the Pool of Geospatial Center has, has done, and they, uh, the PGC ended up being a key contributor to this SDI on behalf of the U.S. Uh, really tremendous data set, and it allowed for a, a lot of capacity development amongst the eight countries. The efforts are continuing. Uh, an un other interesting spawn of this was that the countries are now making that elevation data set better by adding ground control points and allowing to, to redevelop that and, and reprocess it. The errors can be tightened, uh, which is a really great thing to see, and it gave the countries uh, a chance to contribute to this too. The Arctic STI mapping team proposed a Generation 2 Pan-Arctic Dam at the Arctic STI boarding just, board just recently. Uh, and there's a number of other proposed actions which will continue to enhance the Arctic STI and its offerings to the eight Arctic countries. I'll give you a minute just to read those. So in summary, the Arctic SDI, it really improved access to geospatial data that allowed for a number of applications across the Arctic. It was a, a really great way to show collaboration between international partners that all had a common interest in the Arctic and bettering our information there. Uh, this is a very easy group to tell how important common geospatial data infrastructures and frameworks are. I'm sure you can all see those benefits, but this was at a very high level a really good demonstration of that. The geoportal itself allowed for embedded maps, time series visualization, um, and was just a really, really great way to represent all of the contributions from the countries that participated. This cartoon actually, I think, was developed by the Arctic SDI. Um, so thanks to SDI, we now have an interoperable solution to address shared environmental, social, and economic challenges. Uh, so I know the USGS is, is very proud of what we've done, and, and, and uh, if Kevin were here, he would, he would carry that forward with the, the representation from all of the countries. It was a really great effort. A little closer to home, I wanted to talk about what we've, what we've been doing in Alaska specifically. Alaska, what we've, uh, a lot of the mapping efforts contributed to the, the U.S. contribution to the Arctic spatial data infrastructure, but it's a really good story about good governance um, and, and just really uh, modernizing a state that really needed good geospatial information. In 2012, the Alaska Mapping Executive Committee was formed in response to a request from the Alaska Congressional Delegation to update the mapping information in the state. Uh, the topographic maps and a lot of the other underlying data dated from the 60s. Um, it was taken from ortho, or ortho imagery, so sometimes the base was not very good. It wasn't uh, the ortho imagery you would get today. It was quite old. In Alaska, with a rather new landscape like that, rivers move all the time, so the hydrography was off. The, the elevations were off. There was just a dramatic need to increase the, the accuracy and the resolution of the data that was there. Uh, 15 United States agencies and the, the state of Alaska were represented in this, this roundtable or in the AMEC. And its goal was to ensure that Alaska's basic mapping themes met the standards that the rest of the United States were doing. Uh, I, I didn't think that was too tall of a, of a request, mm -hmm. given that they're the first and second largest state, that they should have the same standards that, that all the other states enjoy. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Alaska Mapping Executive Committee set statewide mapping goals for a number of approved mapping themes. And the agencies, a collection of them, were able to pull funding and contribute to these, and, and the states as well, the state of Alaska was contributed quite a bit too, to, uh, to funding efforts to collect data in some cases or process data in other cases to bring up the, the entire geospatial foundation. Um, and in many cases, just the, the advocacy from the state agencies was, was really good too, speaking with the state legislature or speaking with the public uh, or raising awareness of the issue to justify why it was uh, such a good effort that USGS was leading. Uh, the five main themes that we focused on for the first uh, maybe six, seven years are here, elevation, terrestrial hydrography, transportation, shorelines, and grab D. You'll notice that there are leads that came from different agencies. Much like the Arctic SDI, this was a group effort. It's not something one agency could have done themselves. USGS, uh, my agency had the lead for the elevation and for the terrestrial hydrography. The state of Alaska led transportation, and NOAA led the shoreline mapping in, in gravity. The 
this started a little bit, uh, it was a good question. How do you map Alaska? Given all the challenges that we discussed, what's the right instrument? What's the right plan? How do you go about doing this? Uh, we partnered with a company called Dewberry to help us think through that process. And what they came out with, their recommendation was that radar technology, unlike LIDAR in the domestic US in the lower 48, radar was a better technology. The resolution wasn't quite as good as LIDAR. It's more about a five meter product as opposed to a one meter product you get from LIDAR, but it was able to see through cloud cover. Um, and for most of the applications, one meter might have been a bit overkill. And the cost was certainly more advantageous going with radar. So for those reasons and a few other ones, Dewberry, as part of their assessment, had suggested that we investigate using radar to, to do the mapping, the elevation mapping. So that's what we did. Uh, it's a technology called IFSAR, um, Synthetic Aperture Radar. I'm sure a number of you are familiar with that. And it was a, a really advantageous because it penetrates clouds um, and it really had a wide swath, so we were able to cover large areas of ground, uh, unlike fixed wing LIDAR, which is very, very good, but uh, doesn't have quite as wide a swath, and was able to satisfy a number of different applications. Uh, and it was, like I said, it was more cost effective for, for, this, for the state. We worked with two different vendors. This was not a USGS aircraft. We don't have our own Air Force. Uh, uh, like with the lower 48, we rely on the private sector for their capacity to collect these kinds of data. We maintain the spec and we maintain the deliverable and we provide that out to the public. The contract provides three products, uh, a train model, a surface model, and the radar intensity image, which is very, very valuable for looking at brake lines and water features and hydrography. Um, so we now, I'm, I'm really, well, I don't want to spoil the fun. Hang on just a minute and I'll, I'll stomp my feet. Uh, but these are the three products that we got out of the IFSAR deliverables. Um, a surface model that included all the, the, the man-made features and buildings and trees, and then a train model which scraped all those away, and then the radar intensity image. Uh, in addition, as, as sort of a byproduct of uh, flying all over the state, we uh, have a lot more radar reflectors and, and ground control points that are able to be used by other people, whether it's academics or other surveyors in the state. But there's now some more geodetic control as a byproduct of us uh, collecting elevation data. Uh, now here, this is what I was going to foot stomp. I'm really proud to say that uh, since this effort became, uh, really started uh, on mass in about 2013, we wrote the last task order for all of Alaska this summer. We're 100% complete with a collection. It's not all public yet, most of it is, uh, but this is a good way to track what was available. In 2005, it was just uh, um, ANWR, I think is the, the area in blue, is that right? NPRA. NPRA, thank you, National Petroleum Reserve. Um, and then we remapped that actually, I think in, in 18 or 19 because it had gotten so old. But you can really see from about 2013 onward how we were able to cover uh, much of the state. Um, it was really, really tremendous to see this being painted blue um, and a, a great testament to not just the, uh, the partners, but the vendors themselves to be able to have that much uh, fortitude to be able to go through with this operating in the environments that they did. Um, so the last little bits are, I think that's Kodiak Island and some of the Western Aleutians. Those were some of the big areas left, but uh, we're really, really glad to say that the collection was done um, just this summer and hopefully that'll be released uh, next year. Uh, some of, the, uh, some of the, the elevation corrections were dramatic. Uh, I, I mentioned that a lot of the elevation data prior to this collection was very old and dated from the 60s. Uh, Alaska, more than any other state, relies on personal aircraft aviation for getting around. When you have mountains at the wrong place, at the wrong elevation with cloud cover, that's a recipe for disaster. Uh, and, and this is a good example to the, the, the kind of data that was able to be corrected by this elevation update. Um, and it, aviation, it was critical for aviation safety. Um, that was one of the largest drivers for this elevation model to begin with, was the impact it would have on small aircraft and being able to navigate and have a, a product either in the cockpit or as part of flight planning, so that when people were caught in a scenario where they didn't know where they were, uh, it was a, they had a much more reliable base on which to navigate. Um, we talked about terrestrial hydrography. Uh, I was surprised to learn just how much of the nation's fresh water is locked up in Alaska. Uh, it, it is really, really tremendous. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time in Alaska, so it was eye-opening to me. But mapping the surface water at, at, a, at the same kind of a, an accuracy standard as a lower 48 is some, another big, big push that needed to be done with Alaska. It's much more complex. The hydrography is, is not an easy thing to map up there, but USGS is really undertaking that as well. Um, we've 
estimate that there's about $18 million benefit annually from updating this data. I think that's probably underselling it. Uh, but we're working on creating a hydrography data set that would replicate what you're used to seeing, like the national water model, but having it for Alaska. Uh, we've, we have started on, on some basins. And, and that's considered complete when you have the National Hydrography data set, the watershed boundary data set, which is the catchments that feed into the each river reach, and NHD plus high resolution are all updated over the same geography. Uh, the NHD plus high res incorporates, uh, it's a 1 to 24K mapping as opposed to 1 to 250, 1 to 150, excuse me. Um, and we've also done harmonization across the Canadian border uh, with hydrography data, both all across the top tier of the lower 48 as well as with Alaska. And that's a big part too, so we can understand the contributions to and from Alaska with respect to hydrography. The, another priority was creating a new series of Alaska topographic maps. That's something that USGS, that's our bread and butter for, for 30 years or more. Uh, that's what, what's, uh, something I'm proud to say that we've done and we'll be completing the next few years. There's a status where not quite 100% green, but getting close. Um, and now that we started finishing our, some of the major themes like elevation, at a recent AMEC meeting, we looked at what does the next generation look like? Where are we going to be mapping next? Uh, we're going to focus on completing terrestrial hydrography, uh, completing the shoreline delineation mapping, completing GRAB-D, um, updating the imagery next at 50 centimeter, 50 centimeter resolution, and increasing the acquisition of, of coastal topography and bathymetry, another really difficult challenge. And there's a number of other growth opportunities that are uh, just, as in, just as important, but maybe not as priority as those top five. Uh, so thank you very much. It, it has really been really gratifying to see these programs grow. Um, and that's a bit about what USGS and, and our international partners have been doing, uh, because we know this is such an important area. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it was great to get this uh, deep background on the Arctic as well as the efforts going on in Alaska within the U.S. context. And, and Mike, thank you for the uh, acronymania uh, explanation. I think we all suffer from acute acronymania, but we'll keep it on the QT, okay? Um, what I'd like to do now is to segue to the panelists, and I think we have uh, three separate talks. And I believe Rachel and, and Mac, you'll be speaking first. Um, Rachel and Mac both have very interesting backgrounds. They're both from an NGA research office. And collectively, uh, I'm amazed at the level of background and discipline that you have relative to this uh, topic. Uh, Rachel um, has been dealing with the multi multidisciplinary research um, effects of complex systems that impact national security. But I think what was really interesting here is that you specialize on impacts uh, of environmental uh, change to the polar region. So. I think that's a, a definite pertinent topic for us today. And then Mac, uh, as a program manager in the research group, um, the degree of technical background that you've got, I really want to have coffee with you over <laughs> everything from uh, geospatial an analysis to pattern recognition to uh, a deep neural network activity. Uh, it's just it's amazing. And uh, again, with focus in uh, climate. Uh, branch at uh, NASA Langley as well. So I think that the combined uh, expertise here and knowledge is going to be great. I'm going to turn it over to you to give some uh, insight into the topic. Okay. Thank you. Um, oops. Actually, what am I? Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm Rachel. I'm going to be starting today. Um, so thank you for the opening presentation. That was that was perfect. It really set the stage for what we're going to be talking about. And I'm actually going to mention a couple of the same topics that you mentioned because NGA and USGS work together. So um, we've thought about what are the, the things that we want to talk about today. And we have to sum up what are the big themes for mapping the new Arctic. We came up with challenges from the surfaces in the Arctic and then also how we work together because there's so much that we need to do to be um, working across agencies, working across academia, and then also to the commercial sector as well. Um, so since we are from NGA and since I think a lot of people don't know what NGA's mission is, we thought we'd take a little bit of time and just quickly go over the mission and then um, we'll talk to you about how mapping the Arctic fits into NGA's mission space. Okay, so um, Mike mentioned that USGS has the responsibility for mapping, um, wrapping, map mapping the United States. NGA's mission space falls outside of the United States. Um, we support the Department of Defense and the intelligence community and the civil community 
by providing geospatial intelligence. Geospatial intelligence can sort of be defined as analyzing imagery, ge geospatial information to describe, assess, and visually depict physical features on the Earth, and geographically reference activities. Um, NGA also has a mission to produce, evaluate, and catalog what we call foundation data. That's foundation data is topographic, elevation, terrain, land cover, or geodetic data, and that's that foundation data mission is where mapping the Arctic falls into. So for NGA, um, you talked about all the data in the spatial data infrastructure, in the Arctic spatial data infrastructure. This is a stats slide for all of NGA's data globally, um, but there is Arctic data within each one of these components. So we have over a billion features cataloged and hundreds of thousands of standard maps. Um, on air and sea, we're collecting millions of hydrographic features and aeronautic elements. We're also collecting foundation data to represent human geography, where people are, where the names that they, um, the names of the, of the locations that they use and um, other non-physical features. And we collect gravity data to support positioning, the world geodetic system, and geoid models. Um, and at the bottom, you can see we have also have historical data that has been declassified and that's now available to the public. It could be um, accessed through the USGS's long-term archive or the National Archives or the Library of Congress. So I think that's a really important data set to bring up here because we've been talking a lot about change in the Arctic and that is not a widely used resource for people looking at um, previous conditions. Um, so it's, it's because it's difficult to use, it's photographs taken by satellite and dropped in film canisters to Earth. So it's not like you're regularly using this kind of data and you have a, a way to bring it into your current processes. But I always like to bring that up um, when we're talking about the Arctic because it is, it is out there. Um, so um, I also wanted to touch back to a comment that Sandra made earlier in her keynote um, in the previous session. She was talking about the issues of global data sets versus local data sets. And, and I think you were talking about it in terms of how um, when we have global data sets, you're missing the local accuracy issue. So you could be smoothing over some of the local effects um, and you're compromising that by getting a global data set. Most of the NGA data is not global. It's, it's mostly local because it's in high resolution. Um, but you have the opposite impact, which is if you're looking at something from a hemispheric scale or even a global scale, you don't have that consistent coverage on a lot of our data sets. Um, so that also makes it challenging to use for science. Um, so some of the other issues is in the Arctic, there's, um, we talked about the rap challenge of rapidly changing, thawing, and melting surfaces, um, how the coastlines are changing and the human landscape is changing. And this is, the challenge is really similar to the earlier session on flooding because revisit rate becomes really important. Um, and so the more times that you need to revisit an area, you also need to, so what I think about revisit rate a lot of times because we're from NGA, we're thinking about satellite revisit rate. But we also need ground control points and that requires field work component and that all of these pieces are why partnerships are so important because we're not gonna do all of these pieces ourselves. We need to work with the other partners for this. Um, so it's, we're gonna talk today about three specific examples that we're giving for collaborations for mapping the Arctic. Mac is going to talk about glacial remote sensing and she'll go into more detail on that next. Um, the graphic in the middle here is actually um, some work we were doing with the National Ice Center. The U.S. National Ice Center has the mission for mapping sea ice, um, snow, and other environmental conditions for the United States. And so while NGA does not have the mission for mapping sea ice, we can work with them to take their data and, and um, build new visualizations for how to, how to look at this data. And then the, Im the image on the right, I realize this is not the Arctic. Um, this is the, the Antarctic DEM example. Um, it, the same work that happened with Polar Geospatial Center in, um, in University of Minnesota um, also was used to map a high resolution DEM of Antarctica, which was recently released. Um, that was, and I, I think you already mentioned most of this, but I just want to say that that is like a true example of um, one of one of our best collaborations, I think, because you had Polar Geospatial Center running the research for it. Um, they were using university-developed algorithms, university high-performance computing, National Science Foundation was funding it, 
um, NGA was helping with the access to the digital globe imagery. And there were a number of other um, industries, and ESRI, I'm sorry, <laughs> I almost forgot that one, but a number of other academics and industry and U.S. Um, government agencies were involved in that. And I'm going to turn this over to Max to talk about glaciers. Thank you. Yeah, so we wanted to just... Uh we wanted to talk to you guys about a recent uh, project that we've been leading with the uh, Army Corps Cold Regions Engineering Research Laboratory. <laughs> That's another mouthful. Um, that um, we just recently participated in starting early August of this year, and it's still running now. So basically what we did is we um, participated in this expedition to Helheim Glacier, uh, which is depicted by that red dot on the map on the upper right-hand side. It's in the southeast part of Greenland. And this glacier is very interesting because it's actually one of the largest um, outlet glaciers in, in Greenland. Uh, that means that it's exposed to bedrock on both sides. Um, and we were particularly interested in this specific glacier because it currently houses several in-situ measurements uh, instruments like uh, temperature, wind, humidity, and we also have terrestrial LIDAR systems, which are uh, measuring the mass loss at uh, this particular glacier. And fun fact is um, a few people speculate that um, this glacier was responsible for um, sinking the Titanic. So, I mean, I don't know how much, you know, evidence there is of this, but that, that's what it's rumored. Um, so, um, Together with Corel, what we did was uh, we went at the site and we developed, uh, we, we designed and, and deployed these corner reflectors that are on their upper right hand. This is the photograph um, that you see there and also uh, what Mike showed before in his slides. I'm going to go a little bit into detail about these corner reflectors. So what they do is that they light, they light up like a Christmas tree in radar imagery and uh, this is specifically helpful for calibrating radar imagery so that you can get accurate um, eye signatures across the image. Uh, we developed uh, four of them, north on, uh, two on the northern side, two on the southern side. Uh, and you can see them there by the, uh, well, one example is uh, just if, if you look at that right arrow, the red arrow in the upper right-hand side. Um, and this glacier is, is about four kilometers across on average, but it kind of, um, it depends on uh, the mass loss at the time. Um, also, just to make note, you don't just go and fly to Helheim Glacier. Uh, <laughs> you can't just like Uber there, but so you have to, you have to take a flight to Reykjavik uh, and then from Reykjavik, you take a uh, plane, a you, you take a plane to uh, Kalusuk, and from Kalusuk, you either charter a boat or you charter a helicopter to Tasilik. And then from Tasilik, there's one guy <laughs> with a helicopter there. He also happens to be the, um, the son of the, of the gentleman who owns one of two uh, hotels in the, in the island there. And then you get to charter yet another helicopter to get on top of the glacier. We can, you can't just hike up there. So it's quite an ordeal and uh, one of the reasons why it's such a remote area. And another fun fact is that uh, Helheim Glacier is in this area in Norse mythology called the Land of the Dead, which is pretty cool. Um, so we talked about the calibration. What I wanted to mention was that if anybody knew that during the uh, two weeks in August of, August, uh, of um, this year, we had actually one of the largest um, heat waves in um, Helheim Glacier, and we were lucky enough to get uh, imagery over this time. So we got to see some really interesting dynamics going on in the glacier. Um, and you can't really see it here with the worldview pan image, but you can certainly see it in, in imagery like radar. And, um, and you could see things like in Sentinel-1 and Radarsat-2 um, and um, be able to witness like these amazing structures. And um, of course, if you have RGB imagery with the worldview, you can see things like um, really cool lakes and the crevasses that open and close during the uh, days, really. So these high resolution features can be seen with imagery um, and we're very lucky to have uh, these in-situ measurements at the site so that we can correlate these measurements. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I think that's about it. Okay. Um, and I realize we're, we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll go over the last slide or two very quickly. Um, this is the other example that we mentioned, working with the U.S. National Ice Center. The image on the left, it comes directly from the U.S. National Ice Center. They provide the information for, for um, vessels in the U.S. actually going through ice-covered waters. And so they, one of the ways that they produce this information is um, through a weekly hemispheric product. And these polygons all represent up to three different types of ice. So up to three different concentrations of ice and three different stages of development of ice. So the stage of development is sort of a proxy for the, the thickness and the type um, and maybe the strength of the ice as well. So one of the things we worked on with them is turning it into a like simple to read analytic. This is not in any means of like permission to go into the ice for different types of vessels, but the, the examples on the right are for two different ice capable vessel types, um, ice, strength, ice strengthened vessels um, in the same ice conditions. Green is go, red is don't go, and yellow is there's um, ice of land origin like icebergs and we don't know the thickness. Um, so this is something that's still research level that we're working on with the uh, ice center. But again, it's not a, um, it's not prescriptive. Do not, do not follow it <laughs> exactly into the green water, um, into the green ice. And then the last thing is we talked a little bit about some of the partnerships that we have now, but these are the opportunities to work with NGA. We have an academic research program. We actually bring in scientists from outside to come work with us for um, up to five years, cleared or uncleared. Um, and then opportunities on our um, NGA, um, on said biz ops, where you can look if you're from um, commercial sector. And so thank you. We're looking forward to the questions from the panel. Thank you. I think we'll hold the questions for the discussion period uh, and move over to uh, Nicole Kinsman, who is the Acting Deputy Associate Director for Core Science Program at USGS. And she's also um, Alaska's Regional Advisor with NOAA for the National Geodetic Survey. Um, a lot of background in this area and in the previous topic of floods. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're looking forward Sorry, to your talk. Over to you. All right, thank you so much. and. Uh, Thank you for the intro and thanks for the invitation to come and speak here today. I'm having a little bit of an identity crisis because I, uh, I am acting as of this week over with the USGS, so it's kind of them to come and let me talk to you. Um, and I will be talking a little bit about some of the NOAA uh, content and contributions to the Alaska Mapping Executive Committee as well. Um, so I'm a coastal geomorphologist by training and a geodesist by necessity. And when I talk about how I became a geodesist and I tell you that story, I think it really speaks to the story of geospatial data in the Arctic and how far we've come and how far we've come working together. Um, when I got up to Alaska over a decade ago and was working at the local level, really where the rubber hits the tarmac when it comes to geospatial data and building things in Alaska, um, I quickly realized I was not in CONUS anymore. Um, the basic geospatial data sets that you can reach out for and look for from public data sets were not available. And if you want to do some sort of simple project, it would require contracting a whole new data collection, setting out all new ground control, even getting right back down to the nitty gritty of figuring out what reference frame that control even had to be in because you're working off the map. So with that, I want to sort of dive in and give you a little bit more sort of context. I like to set the stage a little bit, uh, having my duty station up in Alaska. Since we have uh, geographers here, here's a geography quiz. Who can tell me where this is? Anyone know? No guesses? <laughs> it is somewhere in Alaska. So this is the Kobuk Valley National Park. It's above the Arctic Circle. And the reason I show you this picture is I like to remind people that the Arctic's not all tundra. It's incredibly, incredibly diverse. We're, we're talking about landscapes that mimic and are analogs for areas that we see all over much of the rest of the globe. Um, and I think that's really important to remind ourselves when we're talking about geospatial topics in the, in the Arctic. Um, and just to give you this example from uh, Alaska, this is a sand dune um, national park uh, north of the Arctic Circle. It's 30 square miles, I believe, of dunes that you might see more likely in the Sahara. And uh, it's a relic of Aeolian deposition from the last ice age. So something to just sort of mix up your uh, preconceptions about what the Arctic is. And the Arctic is changing. And we often think sort of about how that change is really encapsulated with uh, 
thawing permafrost, but there's a lot of other dynamic things that are happening in the Arctic as well, whether that be some of our tectonic activity or all the things that are changing with ecosystems as well as we start to see the trees move further north. And then the beavers follow the trees and that starts to change the river systems. And so we're seeing change at the landscape scale too. So my background, like I said, is in coastal geomorphology. So just to give you a little bit more of a sampling of some of the diversity of Alaska, I wanted to take you on a quick field trip. Um, just really showcasing how we do have coastlines in Alaska that are very similar to coastlines you see, you might see in other parts of the U.S. So there's barrier island systems like you might see in the, in the Carolinas, um, unlithified bluffs like you might find in California. Uh, large deltaic systems like the Mississippi Delta. Um, this yukon kuskokwim Delta system in western Alaska is actually larger than the state of, the whole complex is larger than the state of Louisiana. And uh, rocky, rocky um, cliffs that you might find somewhere like Hawaii where you have basaltic um, uh, deposits along the coast. So very, very diverse area. When we're talking about mapping in the Arctic, we're talking about mapping something that's changing and we're talking about mapping something that's very, very diverse and as was mentioned by the other panelists, very expensive and difficult to get to. Um, so that really takes us back to my own personal story, which is what I wanted to share with you a little bit today. So what I'm showing you here is a photo from a flooding event that happened in Gullivan, Alaska back in 2011. And the reason I'm showing you this is that back in 2011, uh, the IFSAR project that Mike was able to introduce all of you to that collected newer, new high resolution data across the whole state had not been completed over this area yet. So when we were looking at evaluating flood risk in Gullivan, Alaska back in 2011, when this event had occurred, um, the best available DEM in the broader area was the two arc second NED. So you're looking at a 60 meter uh, footprint product. Um, you go and pull that, even if you have an elevation data set and a couple postage stamp elevation data sets that were collected using photogrammetry directly over the community that were also about a decade old, um, you want to go and align that to make a flood map with the forecasted water levels in the offshore. But to do that, you might typically use a tool like VDATUM to align the vertical reference frames. However, VDATUM doesn't exist in Alaska, and one of the reasons for that is there are so few tide gauges. So the entire northwest coast of Alaska um, has about the same number of tide gauges as the state of Delaware, right? So when we're talking about operating in an area with a dearth of information, especially back in 2011, there really was not much to go on. And that's really why I describe myself as a geodesist by necessity. As someone who was tasked with working with local, gov with local governments to develop and create coastal hazard products for local community assessments and for infrastructure projects, we need to get right back to the bottom layer of things and figure out the geospatial framework that we needed to establish so that we could even bring together disparate data sets as we started to work with partners and uh, with others to fill in all those data gaps that we have in the Arctic. So um, the last thing I wanted to mention just in the short time that I had was to highlight some of the contributions to the Alaska Mapping Executive Committee uh, that my home office has, has contributed. And this is really bundled into three key areas, uh, the GRAVD surveys, NSRS modernization, and shoreline mapping and rapid ortho imaging uh, in, the, in, in Alaska. Uh, the first thing, National Spatial Reference System modernization. You may think, well, who really cares if we redefine latitude, longitude, and elevation? Uh, if you're familiar with NAD 83 and NAVD 88, that's being replaced by a modernized system in 2022. And it's a big boon for the Arctic. It really, really is. Uh, there's sort of three ways that I can highlight that. The first is that the new system is geocentric. It's defined by relationships to a global and international ideal frame, which means if you're working with uh, satellite data and locally collected data with local control, it's easier to align those data sets. It also means that it's easier for UAS systems to interact with the built infrastructure. So having that in a global shared context that's consistent is really, really important. The other thing is that the new uh, National Spatial Reference System is time dependent, and so the coordinates in the new system have latitude, longitude, elevation, um, and height, I'm uh, sorry, and time. So by having that time component, it makes it a lot easier to monitor things that are undergoing change um, at rapid scale. So if you're looking at changing sea level trends, or if you want to monitor subsidence due to ice loss, this is something that's really important. Um, the last thing is that 
the modernized NSRS is primarily accessed via GPS technology. If you're working in the Arctic and historically you wanted to get uh, latitude and longitude uh, or height established, you had to find a passive control mark, a benchmark or, or other control point. Um, finding that in really remote areas and carrying those control out into really remote areas is very expensive. So GPS has enabled high quality, high accuracy positioning in really remote areas like in the Arctic. And part of that is the creation of a gravimetric geoid model, which improves the height component of those GPS access positions. Um, improving that height component uh, is I'm going to talk about it a little bit more because that's some of the gravity surveys that we're conducting. Uh, but one of the other things that's wrapped up in that is that the height system is now defined in tandem with Canada, and we're working to ensure that we actually have consistent height. So if you're working in a, a water basin or doing some project along the border, you no longer have two different vertical height systems. So I know that's something that a lot of people in Alaska are excited about with modernized NSRS. Um, one of the things that Mike mentioned that NOAA's contributed to uh, with regards to the partnership through the Alaska Mapping Executives Committee is collection of gravity data over Alaska. And this is actually a project that's happening across the whole U.S., but we started in Alaska because that is the part of the U.S. where there's the greatest gain um, from having those new gravity surveys conducted and building that new gravimetric model. And the reason that we want a good geoid model uh, is when we're accessing positions using GPS, the GPS only gives you your position relative to an idealized frame. Um, it's not giving you a society, societally relevant height so that water flows from the, the tall numbers to the low numbers. And so we need a nice geoid model to be able to translate those GPS heights into heights that are um, of importance to the things that we do in, in our work. Um, I'm pleased to also announce, I can stomp my feet also, <laughs> uh, NOAA completed the gravity surveys over uh, the mainland portion of Alaska last year, and we've been working really, really closely with NGA in the last few years especially to develop the improved gravimetric geoid model that will be used in the modernized NSRS. And so the experimental geoid model that we have released now um, includes all of those gravity surveys that have been conducted with the exception of down around southwestern Alaska. And then we'll, we're planning to collect the Aleutians in 2020. So a big step forward in terms of the vertical, the vertical height system that we're able to use in Alaska. And this is a combination of data that's coming in from ground gravity surveys, airborne and satellite. And the gravity project's the, the airborne component of that. And the last thing I wanted to highlight was uh, some of the work that NOAA's been doing with our remote sensing division uh, for rapid semi-oblique imaging. Um, this is a camera system we actually use quite a bit to support FEMA after emergency response. But when it's not being used post-hurricanes, we try to bring it up to Alaska and image areas as pre uh, condition imaging of the coastline and the coastal conditions. And one of the nice things about this system is because it's used for emergency response, it can actually uh, conduct very rapid collection. So uh, when there's a good weather window, you can get out and collect a lot. Uh, more than 20% of Alaska was able to be collected in less than two weeks last time we brought the plane up uh, two years ago. And this serves as pre-event oblique imagery for Arctic coastlines and it's geo-referenced and GIS ready. Uh, the last thing, uh, mapping the new Arctic uh, to talk about some of this is some of the work in Alaska that's ongoing with coastal mapping, another theme that's emerging with the uh, AMEX group. Uh, the state of Alaska has been working together uh, with all of the other uh, members of the federal mapping uh, committee with the Alaska Mapping Executive Committee um, through the Integrated Ocean Coastal Mapping Program at NOAA and the Integrated Interagency Working Group on Ocean and Coastal Mapping to develop a prioritization and a strategy for mapping the coastal areas in Alaska. This is the update of the refreshed imagery, topobathy, which is very difficult to get in Alaska, and uh, also an uh, uh, update of the shoreline vector. And they're just releasing the uh, results from this prioritization survey in the last uh, month, and the report itself is coming out at the end of the year or early next year, and it includes um, a prioritization that was completed by local and state agencies as well, as well as all the federal partners, and this will be used to inform the 3D Nation survey, which is a follow-on to a lot of the update, uh, to a lot of the work that is going to guide future mapping activities at the USGS and, and with partners. And with that, I will say thank you for your time.
Thank you. So our last speaker is uh, Michael Brady, a cartographer, yes, with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency Maritime Safety Unit. Um, I think your exposure to the polar regions in Alaska started with your graduate work, PhD work? Correct. And uh, has proliferated throughout your career. So I'm looking forward very much to your uh, comments, sir. You have the floor. Great, thank you. Okay, so we're, we're out of time. Um, so, <laughs> thank you. No, um, so I'll try to get to, through this quickly. Uh, again, um, Mike Brady with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. I'm a cartographer, um, but I'm, I'm not here to present on anything NGA uh, affiliated. I'm going to be uh, stepping through my recent doctoral research where I uh, worked with Alaska natives uh, in the North Slope Borough to co produce a, a coastal risk geographic information system. Um, so I hope to spark a discussion here on the role of local Arctic communities in uh, Arctic mapping and uh, Arctic science more generally. So sea ice uh, is melting, diminishing, and uh, permafrost is thawing. This is exacerbating already a very rapid coastline change along uh, Alaska's northern coastline, uh, where the erosion rates are among uh, the highest in the world in some locations. and. Um, so my, my research is not focused on understanding the, the geophysical processes involved here. I am interested in working with the local communities to understand the impacts on the people that live there and are feel, uh, feeling the effects. Um, so um, when, we, when we hear about the coastline change in, in Alaska and the impacts, we generally hear about the impacts to physical infrastructure within the villages, such as impacts to uh, roads, buildings, utilities, and, and so forth. But when you talk to local communities there, you realize that that's not the whole story. When you consider other locally important land uses, such as subsistence hunting, where they're really using the entire coastline, uh, you quickly realize that it's not just what's happening along the tiny stretches of coastline in the village. Of course, those impacts are extremely important, but it's not the whole story. It's not the, the only impacts that are locally relevant. So when I learned this, um, I set out to systematically collect local voices uh, along Alaska's northern uh, coastline um, and communicate the impacts that I was hearing from the local voices uh, by creating a, a geographic information in collaboration with the North Slope Borough. So during the process of this research, the North Slope Borough uh, said that we would like to officially collaborate with you on this because we want to hear about the impacts that are happening on our coastline. So this, uh, this is a uh, select land use uh, map of uh, uh, Alaska's North Slope. So we're in the top of Alaska, the United States' most northern and largest municipality. Um, the purpose of this map, the takeaway, is that land use extends far beyond village locations. So the villages in this map are indeed represented by the black dots, and um, I've shown the uh, collective subsistence land use for all eight municipalities up there, shown as uh, green hash marks. As you can see, that land use extends across the entire vast coastline, not just within the villages. Uh, gold and brown areas are Alaska Native uh, uh, Corporation lands. These are used for profit. They were established under the Alaska Native uh, Claims Act of 1971. Um, and the one more land use I'll point out is the, uh, the gray boundary around the region. This is uh, the boundary for the Alaska Native Controlled North Slope Borough. Uh, the borough was established in the early 70s by the Inupiaq to uh, tax oil and gas activity in the region. This is a very resource rich region of the world. Uh, most of the oil and gas projects are out of Prudhoe Bay, which uh, uh, those, that oil, that product is transported to market via the Trans Alaska Pipeline System. Uh, now, this borough allows the local uh, communities to uh, uh, have access to extremely expensive uh, physical uh, municipal infrastructure and services. So it's very important for, for the locals. Uh, and all of these, these land uses are important for um, Alaska uh, native self-determination. Um, so to collect local views of coastline change risks happening in the region, I worked in three municipalities, Wainwright, Utkiavik, and Koktovik. Uh, something I'll point out here is the collective subsistence land use extent shown in green covers the coastline of two important federal land use, the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska and the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to the right. Uh, the, these stretches of coastline, I wanted to make sure I had local knowledge along them because they're subject to important and complicated um, uh, decisions, uh, land use decisions to balance subsistence and hydrocarbon development. 
So uh, this is the co-production model that I've developed for the, for the study. I'm going to briefly uh, step through this. It's going to be high level. Uh, it consists of three collaborative steps. The first step is to create, uh, verify the local risks. So I collected all available data of assets, including sub subsistence uh, camps um, and other asset data. And I uh, did community mapping workshops to collect the local knowledge. Um, and I integrated this asset data with a shoreline change susceptibility data model, which is based on the U.S. Geological Survey's recent shoreline change data product, where every 50 meters they provide historical shoreline change. And I added additional layers, including shoreline type, and I created a wind fetch model to show distance to uh, minimum CIS extent for uh, 2012. Um, so I integrated these two data sets together. Um, I called it an exposure database, and I worked with the, the local GIS team for the North Slope Borough to install that on the internal uh, land use web mapping system that they use to support uh, decision land use decisions in the context of large-scale oil and gas development. And, and once we had that on the internal web mapping system, we uh, engaged uh, local land use managers to collect per perceptions about usability to uh, refine the tool. Um, and once that data was in the borough's hands, it's up to them how they wanted to use it and disseminate it. For the researcher, my job is just to step, step through this process again, incorporate all the feedback that, that I received, and improve the GIS the idea being through time you'll get a usable GIS that has decision impacts. Now, um, when I present this work, I usually focus on the uh, results from the workshop, uh, but kind of a, a bigger picture um, aspect of this that I want to bring up here is that there's also value to just doing this, the, the process of the collaborative mapping. So it's not just the, the coastal risk product, it's the social networking that you're, you're developing capacity to access uh, local observations in a very remote place along very important stretches of, of the coastline that are nationally uh, uh, important to the country, energy security, national security, very important uh, coastlines. Um, so you're uh, this is this process that I've developed in addition to creating a, a GIS that's usable locally. Um, it's, a, it's a structured way to engage local Arctic communities in Arctic observing network activities more broadly. So it's known to be uh, very important but very challenging to incorporate local Arctic communities in Arctic observing network programs. And once, you know, you realize that it's not just coastal risk you're talking about. You can you can de design the studies to uh, have better access to in situ observations, and also you can help uh, identify local information needs that the Arctic Observing Network can address. So uh, the community mapping workshop that I did to collect local perspectives of coastline change, I had about 50 participants uh, in the three communities who uh, contributed about 300 uh, places where they've identified some kind of problem. So I showed up with like 30 feet of map and asked them to place coded stickers all on the coastline and tell me about the issue uh, either verbally in writing and then I uh, digitized all of that to do the analysis. And I came up, I created th uh, three main bins, subsistence impacts, industrial impacts, and municipal at the North Slope scale. Uh, to give one example of uh, a major risk that was identified in, in Utqiagvik from land use manager, uh, this is Cross Island, about uh, it's just north of the Prudhoe Bay oil complex. Uh, New, the village of Nuiqsut, located about 200 kilometers southwest, relies heavily on Cross Island for their uh, to hunt the bowhead whale. Bowhead whale hunting is extremely important for local communities on the North Slope. Not just a major food security issue, but uh, it's it basically the glue that holds the community together. It's it's critical for uh, cultural identity and. Uh, the fear is that um, because Cross Island is so important for New Exit to, uh, to successfully hunt the bowhead whale, if they lose that ability, then you may be talking about a, a village that gets decimated. And this is already happening in the context of large-scale oil and gas development, lots of social pressures there. Uh, the uh, Cross Island, the bowhead activity out of there is monitored by the federal government to uh, assess the impacts of oil and gas development. Uh, but to my knowledge, there's no systematic monitoring of the island itself, despite, despite its critical importance for new exit. Uh, the information usability workshop, this consisted of me doing a live demonstration of this, this GIS that was installed on the local intranet uh, land use mapping system. Um, I did a, a brief presentation on how I created the data to give a window into kind of the back end, what they were looking at to be able to start to evaluate it, and just showed them the basic capability. You can select a transect and bring up environmental information, or you can zoom to an asset of interest to bring up some shoreline change susceptibility information. Uh, and then after I did the, the presentation, uh, demonstration, I asked a series of questions to get uh, perceptions uh, uh, that were focused on getting uh, th uh, three dimensions of information usability. So saliency, credibility, and legitimacy 
is a widely used framework for information usability. So saliency, what is it relevant uh, for your job? I, I heard a lot about the borough's per permit review process where they're, they're uh, evaluating oil and gas projects, road uh, construction projects, and they're doing without access to coastline change information. And they saw that as an information flaw. They're relying on the developers to provide that information. So uh, that was one piece of relevancy that came up. As far as credibility, they don't know enough about the data to evaluate it, but they do see it as um, uh, a screening tool to do a quick, a quick look to decide whether or not they need to look closer. Uh, legitimacy, so how well the, the, the tool represents local values and priorities. First thing they pointed out was you have to do your mapping in New Exit. Uh, this is where a lot of this, this development's happening. Uh, this is, as I showed, showed earlier, some uh, coastline change effects that directly impact subsistence activity. So that would be a next step to enhance legitimacy. And the idea is you can keep going back and asking these same questions, and then through time you get more specific about what, what the product can, can address. So back to this big picture, the you know viewing it not just the, the as a, uh, a GIS product that addresses coastal risk, the process and the map can also be viewed more generally as a boundary object that allows you to transform Arctic observing activities into usable information products to realize societal benefits. So uh, we're looking at it as a um, the result of an exercise I did to identify Arctic observing activities that make it possible to create the GIS. Many of the uh, USGS products are, are and NOAA products are are shown here. So this is a Subset. Um, and then to the left, I've identified users and then potential societal benefit impacts. Um, and then I'll, I'll end with noting that. Uh, while the focus here was on uh, coastal risk, bringing uh, coastline change information to local managers, uh, this process of uh, doing this web mapping is not just um, to address that narrow uh, set of issues. The, the broader point of inter interacting in this very remote place and having access to local observers opens up opportunities to, to address other problems and uh, prepare for things like environmental uh, disasters like an oil spill. So the same coastline change information that's usable for local land use decisions is also critical when you're preparing for um, and responding to uh, an, an oil spill. For example, and don't, don't underestimate the remoteness of this place. If you're uh, looking to send an asset to a really sensitive lagoon and you're looking at a map that was developed last year, it's already outdated. This place is rapidly changing and really there might be only one person because they travel to their camp that knows the status of a cut that allows you access to that lagoon. So this becomes very important local knowledge in the context of disaster preparedness on there. Thank you for your time. So as your moderator, I did a poor job on time management, but uh, I think the, uh, the content was excellent. I thank you all for the presentations. I'd like to turn it over to uh, the folks in the room and online uh, for any clarifying questions uh, that you'd like to ask the, uh, the panel. There's got to be a few. Oh, uh, please, do you have a microphone handy? Uh, I, so, so for for Michael's talk, could you identify it, it, yourself, please? I, I'm C.K. Shum from Ohio State University. Um, I am not a social scientist. I work with one. So, so the question to you, <laughs> the question to you is that: so, are there migrations in the area that um, that you notice, like like the local people, do they migrate out? So that's my question. Yeah, and uh, you know, settlement patterns on the North Slope is very complicated. And when you start to look at the available data, like census data, it's not you're, it's not an adequate data set. Uh, this, this is a population that doesn't necessarily want to be counted, and they certainly don't want to be uh, associated with one particular place. That's one of the points of this presentation: is the activity is not just happening in these these villages; it's happening all along the, using the entire region. The general migration pattern in the North Slope is towards Utqiagvik, which is uh, uh, the the biggest city there, it's about 10,000 people uh, to see to the borough government. And in general, the populations are, are moving uh, in, into that area. Um, but at the same time, you have individuals moving to other villages and, and uh, outside. But you do find that uh, because of the cultural, the bowhead whale hunting, this people may leave for educational purposes, but many of them come back. But I think the, the population is more or less stable. And then, then you, you get into, there's also the oil and gas population, which is, is, a, is, a, is a different issue, but also important to, to acknowledge. It's not just the uh, local natives that live there. Other questions? Yeah, good. Dan Brown, University of Washington. This is a naive question, I think. 
what is the um, frequency of terrain mapping that we need, given the, it's a hard question, I guess, if framed that way, uh, given the dynamics of the terrain relative to melting and climate change and that sort of thing, I guess uh, maybe a, a better way to put it is uh, how much uncertainty do we have in the terrain products that we have, given the temporal dynamics? I think there's probably a couple of answers. I can give a very technical answer to the IFSAR that it's a uh, five meter horizontal resolution and it's got two, three meter vertical error, I think, maybe a little less. Uh, but I think your question is really how often do you need to collect that kind of data? Um, I don't know if we quite need persistent surveillance, but it seems like you need something that's pretty close. Um, with the advent of satellite imagery and uh, things like what Paul Marin has done with structure from ocean, you can almost get get that where you have repeat coverage pretty frequently. Um, whether that captures the air of phenomenology you're trying to collect, that's a different question. Uh, depends on what you're trying to collect, I think, but I'm, I'm sure there are other answers here too. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a really hard question. <laughs> um, I, I was going to say something similar about the work that Paul Moran is doing. He's using Digital Globe, Worldview, polar orbiting satellites that have a really high revisit rate, um, which is great, but then they're, they're optical, so it's cloudy a lot of the time. So you, even though you have that high revisit rate when they're not being challenged by another need that they would need to be used for, um, we really can't get that revisit rate with satellites right now. Um, but it just depend, it depends on the surface that you're looking at and the time of year. It, I guess it's sort of a, a related question is, or you're, that you're raising is that time frequency of re, revisit rates are an important element of mapping the Arctic here that may not be so important in other places. And so deploying those kinds of technologies is important. In I was just going to say um, data-driven refresh rates are something that we're really keen in dialing into more in the Arctic, which I think is one of the things you're getting at. And it's been really challenging. And at the very end of my presentation, I showed that prioritization survey for coastal mapping. And coastlines, there's one of the areas that are undergoing some of the most change, especially on the North Slope. And even in those areas, it's very chicken and egg. I mean, the rates are nonlinear. They are changing, and as those are changing, the refresh rate is also changing. And so trying to track those things um, so that you can ensure that you are filling in the gaps on a, on a renewing basis while also maintaining national and international consistency is really challenging, and it does get back to a chicken and egg dilemma. And we really, that's one of the reasons I think uh, we really need to speak to the value of having so many different parties involved and having so many partnerships and having close connections to the people on the ground who can highlight those areas of greater priority where the need is and when it arises. I just wanted to add that I think what's important here is data fusion because we have to be able to fuse things like in situ measurements, satellite imagery, airborne, um, information coming from the regional communities, um, and also looking at the different accuracies and errors within our sensors, specifically in Arctic, uh, because, because we have areas that are melting. Uh, when you're using things like synthetic aperture radar, for example, it doesn't do very well when things are uh, covered with water. Um, even though we are using it for flood mapping, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be accurately measuring ice when it's covered with water. That has a lot to do with the physics of the primitivity, which cannot penetrate through the radar and things like that. Bill? Yeah, sorry. Well, that wasn't an ignorant question. Would you, how'd you phrase Naive. It? Naive, yeah. So this one is a naive question, certainly. <laughs> So I'm always interested in this idea of like, um, you know, the rates of environmental change and how we sort of, you know, understand them. And of course, I, you know, I think about like places like New York City that had incredibly dynamic rates of environmental change um, and sort of physiographic change, you know, throughout much of the last couple of centuries. And now we've got the technology to sort of start to understand that a little bit. And I guess, you know, this is a question both to you all, but also us, you know, other folks more generally in the room, you know, 
Are, is there any lessons learned? And you know, Grady sort of started a conversation this morning about the Climate Central piece, sort of saying that we don't probably have the right data or new data becomes available. We understand the risk of sea level rise even even more more powerfully. So I guess the question I have, and I know the urban context is, is very difficult to sort of, you know, the dynamic urban context in the global south particularly is highly dynamic. And, you know, how, how do you sort of measure the rates of environmental change in those kinds of contexts and then sort of like in other other uh, places of dynamic um, change, like in the in the high Arctic. So I guess the question is: Is there, you know, for you guys, lessons learned back to the urban community, or from the urban people who are looking at dynamic urban places? Is there any lessons learned that could be, you know, provide some reference to understanding rates of, you know, measure rates of uh, dramatic uh, environmental change in, in the high Arctic? So I know it's, you know apples and oranges potentially, but I think that I'm always interested that can we do any cross, is there any cross kind of learning between these different communities? You know, the, the ur folks looking at urban dynamic urban places and other dynamic environmental change locations as well. So that's a big sloppy question. Um, I think there's a question in there and certainly naive, uh, but thank you. I, I like that question. I think there are a lot of ways to answer it, and I hope you get a different answer from all of us. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, um, so I think it's, it's actually we, in the session we heard this morning, there was a lot of talk about um, stakeholder involvement, understanding what the user's needs are, and understanding what, what people want from the products that you're providing. And, and we didn't really talk about that today because Mike touched on it a little bit more. Um, but, but that's absolutely a lesson learned is getting, getting people involved early on and um, don't start a new mapping project until you have somebody who wants it. Um, those are things that, that we learn all the time and relearn um, and still make the mistake. But um, the, the urban change community has done a really good job with that. Anybody? So when I sort of think about that question, um, I think about it in sort of two, what's that two-way flow of information? And I think there's lots of little things that um, we can do when it comes to an exchange of knowledge. But one of the unique things that uh, we gain in remote Arctic environment is um, the experience of what's been happening in developed um, urban environments because we have a largely natural setting. And so we have the opportunity to design green infrastructure from a green state. Um, and that's something that we haven't always been able to do in a lot of urban environments. And so we can use the lessons learned from development patterns in cities to figure out how we can develop and responsibly um, create uh, uh, new development in, in the Arctic. Um, and then exchanging the information the other direction, um, one of the things we like to say in Alaska um, and in the Arctic in general is if you can do it in Alaska, you can do it anywhere. <laughs> um, because it is, it is remote, it's very hard to do things. Um, and so when it comes to uh, piloting and trying out uh, drone systems and things like that, that's not something you'll easily be able to pioneer in an ur a dense urban area, area necessarily. Uh, but being able to do something like that in the Arctic is, is a really a unique opportunity. So two-way two information. So my, my read on this question, uh, thinking more, more generally what I hear about um, in uh, the context of trying to organize science in the Arctic is that there's an interest in identifying how Arctic science is relevant in general for lower latitudes, what we can, what insights we can learn. And some, uh, some themes that I've, I've Learn, I've kind of come across that I think are, are prominent and, and worth talking about in that, in that uh, context is the role of uh, and the emphasis on non-market values in doing kind of evaluations and um, the, role, the, the emphasis that's placed on stakeholder values and priorities in, in the, the Alaska context. I think because you're so closely related to, you know, connected to the ecosystems there, I'm not saying that those, that doesn't happen elsewhere in the world, but when you think of cities, it's more kind of the built infrastructure. And I think this is something that the methods that have, that have that are continuously being done have been done for for many years in Alaska settings. The uh, the the work working closely very with uh, very very closely with local communities. I think those methods can be can enhance what's being done in in other uh, settings in lower latitudes, including urban settings. And then collaboration. I think it's something about the Arctic that's very unique is that you just you really need to collaborate, uh, work across boundaries to get things that you can do uh, more readily in the lower latitudes. So it's something I've seen in Alaska. You have unique collaborations that develop to do what's much easier to do in the lower latitudes. I think that's something that, you know, the closer you get to the urban setting, closer you get to D.C., you start to see these stovepipes happening. Uh, I think that those stovepipes, the same agencies kind of tend to come together when you go to a place where you really need to collaborate. So. Yeah, I, I would extend that one, too. The 
with both the Alaska Mapping Executive Committee and the Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure make use of the governance structures that exist. Um, I, I've, I've been really impressed and, and frankly surprised at the level of coordination amongst federal agencies given some of these structures. Um, as a research scientist, I've looked at my bosses above me and thought the governance and the meetings were a waste of time. I can tell you from my job now, it is really important and very fruitful. Um, so seek out some of those relationships. In many ways, this is the only way that you'll be able to get what you want accomplished because we can't do everything alone. Hi, uh, Grady, Tool 3D Ideas. Uh, I have a question, I think, for uh, Nicole and Mike. Uh, and Nicole, I'm, as a NOAA alum, I'm going to ask you to put your NOAA hat on for this question. Um, so as we, as we begin to change the refresh rate and certainly the resolution and accuracy um, of shoreline data uh, up on the north, um, I, I'd like to just remind everyone that the mean high water line from the NSPS is the legal boundary of the U.S., right? So I'm wondering if what you're seeing, or are you seeing uh, more attention at the local level being paid to any changes in ownership of, um, of, of land or, 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 or mineral rights associated with changing, uh, changing borders uh, as, as, we, as, as the shorelines are changing, if you would? Is this a topic up there? Yeah, I mean, I can I can take that one to start. Um, it's less of a topic than you'll think. Um, I have heard from folks that are concerned about um, uh, fish camp and hunting camp property. So there's a lot of historic and cultural um, land use that's distributed, um, but that's really. Um, not regulated in the same way that land use is necessarily in the lower 48. And when it comes to the mean high water definition, um, especially on the North Slope, it's so um, it's non-tidal on the on the North Slope of Alaska. And so that mean high water line is migrating backwards. But even with the reduced number of tide stations up there, it's still something that can be delineated um, more easily than it might be uh, in the areas on in Western Alaska where the erosion rate is actually um, more gradual. Um, and so from a practical perspective, I haven't seen that arising too much, um, but it is something we might see uh, as we move forward. I'll, ju I'll just add that uh, you know, the land use on the, on, in Alaska, North Slope I'm most familiar with, is not static. Mm -hmm. So uh, lands are being uh, transferred, uh, withdrawals are constantly being made, and the changing shoreline does does impact those selections, uh, both out of you know preference for using land. You know, if you're eroding away, you don't necessarily want to own that piece of land, but also uh, legal for legal purposes. So uh, regional corporation lands, for example, uh, to have uh, uh, surface rights in the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska, uh, you have to use that part parcel of land for commercial or industrial purposes. And there's a place over called Cape Halkett uh, that's uh, thought to be rapidly eroding. The Eusterological Survey uh, uh, rates show that it's eroding rapidly. The, the uh, regional corporation, the native re regional corporation there says they're actually seeing accretion happening. And they want to develop that parcel because they, uh, you know, would like to access some of the, uh, capture some of the benefits of their oil and gas development. So the, if they're unable to develop, if they don't get approvals, to develop, then they might need to give up that parcel of land. And this kind of thing is playing out uh, elsewhere. You're getting uh, the native corporations uh, are looking to secure land where there might be uh, an oil pipeline that lands there. Uh, it's, happen it's happening over by Wainwright in Alaska, where uh, a parcel of land several years ago now was recently transferred by an old uh, defense early warning radar site um, because that may be the landing point for an oil and gas pipeline to connect offshore to the Trans-Alaska Pipeline system. Um, now. The, that might not happen because it, it's very difficult to barge through the, the inlet that would require, be required to uh, sustain that as a, an industrial base. So that's a, a environmental pressure that is making that scenario for a pipeline unlikely. And that's not just North Slope interest, obviously that, that's bigger Alaska uh, having access to the offshore oil and gas development. So just think this, this is not static land use that people are moving. And I think that um, we uh, wrongly conceptualize the region when we think of those land uses as static. And I would just add, too, that it's not just land. Um, there's maritime extent, too. And so as that's uh, moving, as the shoreline's retreating, we're seeing a shift in the defined territorial limits of the U.S. and the Arctic as well. And that has strong implications for uh, development of the Arctic region. <laughs> Oh, 
Glenn, Glenn McDonald from UCLA. I had two questions. One was geopolitical, and the other one was technical. The geopolitical one is um, really look at the cooperation with Russia and the SDI, and you know, Russia has reacted pretty strongly to the U.S. Marine training along the Norwegian border and things like that. There's been various flight episodes that have happened in terms of the Arctic, in terms of, of mm -hmm. Russian aircraft and mm -hmm. things like that. Do you find that 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 just basically is noise in the background and the cooperation continues? Or is the way you guys are cooperating such that, you know, tactical or strategical products aren't being developed from it? You know, how what what's the political sense there? Uh, I can speak to it anecdotally, just from when the U.S. was leading the, the Arctic SDI effort and just from what I heard from the national contact point. Uh, I think it's it was mostly noise. It was we were a few layers below that top geopolitical level and were perhaps a bit insulated. But I, I would hear that uh, we would plan for Arctic Council meetings, and at the last minute Russia wouldn't be able to go, or they would miss a few, and then they would show up with the world's best data, uh, and they would contribute for a little while, and then they would fall off, and then they would contribute again. Uh, so I think in the end it ended up being a little bit of noise, but in the most people really, and I think all countries did collaborate and contribute. I just, yeah, thank you very much. I just was wondering about that. The other thing is that, so the coastline change is important in the Arctic, but I think far more important is permafrost degradation. And I know that in Nature there was a paper that came out looking at, I think, Landsat data up to 2014 by Nietzsche et al. as a kind of an overview map. So is there any kind of a way or a thought about having some sort of dynamic product which will be monitoring permafrost uh, degradation uh, over time? I think there's a lot of interest in that, and there's even a lot of interest in improving a map of permafrost extent as well, which uh, is, is actually fairly poor still. So that's an outstanding data gap, and it gets back to that. We'd love to be able to monitor it better, but the baseline data is still somewhat inadequate. The USGS has a, a very large footprint in Alaska. We have an Alaska Science Center with a number of scientists that are carrying on studies all across the state. Um, I think they've mostly produced those kinds of products as one-offs or static products, not dynamic ones. I don't, I'm just unaware, or I don't have the background to, to speak to what the, the refresh or update or monitoring would be. But as you mentioned, there's a lot of interest. It's definitely something we're, we're following. So one way that you can measure uh, differences in permafrost change is to use INSAR, interferometric SAR. The problem with that is that you need an exact orbital uh, revisit. So if you, orbit one has to go in orbit one in the 16th day cycle that it comes back, the, the satellite's going back to. But um, the good news is that the Canadians just launched in May their uh, RCM uh, uh, radio type constellation, which is the revisit rate now is going to be four days because they have more than one um, SAR system. So I think that people should definitely make use of that if possible. Okay, I think the time allotment is just about exhausted. Mm -hmm. I want to thank our keynote speaker and our panelists for the great contributions today, everything from uh, the international level of sharing and cooperation that's going on all the way to the local perspective and uh, the need to ground yourself uh, in the support uh, to the locals all the way up to the international level. And I was really impressed with the, uh, the level of innovation going on to capture uh, the basic information necessary to, to really understand uh, the area, uh, and I want to thank you all for your contributions. And round of applause, please. Break till uh, 2.45. Right, a 15-minute break.